Now, more and more parents are falling victim to this crazy gender identity narrative, confusing their children in the name of inclusivity. Take a look. We didn't assign a gender at birth. I'm letting this little person be who they want to be. It is an experiment. What they're doing is unprecedented. On 60 Minutes. You can't tell what your gender is by looking at your body. What are some of the biggest challenges? Strangers in the street have had quite a strong response. Why are you so obsessed? Why do you need to know? We're not trying to eliminate gender. It's really helping kids find their own path to it. So that's a show in 60 Minutes. It's gone, the, that clip has gone viral around the world. They're calling them the babies, rather than boys or girls, babies or some nonsense. But it goes even deeper than that. A new report for in the UK from the Policy Exchange so shows just how widespread this insidious ideology is. And this report says that 40% of schools in the UK are pushing gender self-identification. That's where your kids say, oh, I'm a boy or I'm a girl or whatever. And only 28% of schools would inform parents, that's you, if their child was gender confused. Joining us to discuss the findings. Brilliant Talk TV contributor, Esther Kraku. Esther, always great to see you. Um, so this kind of gender madness, you've seen the clip about the uh, Australian TV show about it, but that sparked people in Britain, uh, this one policy exchange uh, study showing that nearly half of schools are pushing this stuff. Yes, I mean, there have been whistleblowers uh, in schools that have been saying that really they're losing the fight to try and keep this sort of gender ideology out of schools. But when you find out that almost half of schools are allowing children to self-ID without parental consent, you really do realise how far this ideology has 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 gone uh, it is quite worrying just because you know this is clearly child abuse let's let's you know call a spade a spade the idea of raising your children without gender is, is patently absurd you're effectively experimenting with the mental health of your children because you're not giving them any foundational you know sense of identity you're allowing them to go through life as some sort of genderless widget uh, that has no sort of that's not rooted in any sort of reality. And it really it really is harming children. And the, 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 the data is very clear. You're effectively priming your children to have mental health issues in the future because you're refusing somehow to, to let them understand that there is a connection between their sex and their gender. You know, back in the day, they were literally the same thing in the French language. They're interchangeable. Um, but it, it's becoming institutionalized, this ideology. And various teachers that are, you know, making, making this more well, making the public more aware of what is going on. They are effectively losing their jobs. I, I was on a show on, um, uh, with a fellow teacher that lost his job as a result of asking, you know, what are the, the safeguards in place for a student that he had that identified as the, the opposite gender? And he was effectively struck off because they said that was none of his business. And he asked, has, has the student's parents been informed? And he's now looking for a job. I mean, it's really insidious. And I don't think people realise how far it's gotten. In, in, well, it, well, it's, straight, it's straight out Marxism, uh, Esther. Straight out Marxism, it reminds us of Pol Pot re-educating children. James? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, this whole push to essentially say that biological reality doesn't exist, that all of these sorts of things, you know, aren't as we thought they were, there's a broader problem here, Esther, that I can see where it's now creating an instability within wider society, that broader society now, because these sort of fundamental pillars of how we understand the world are now being kicked out from underneath us, and especially in the schools. It's creating generational problems, it's causing problems in academia, it's causing problems in the corporate world. What are you seeing in the UK? Because I know that what happens in the UK winds up coming out here to Australia eventually, um, and you're further down this path than, than we are. Oh. What should we be looking out for? Well, we should be looking out at the, the signs of transgenderism as an ideology. I mean, J.K. Rowling made the point that many children that identify as transgender, the overwhelming majority of them do grow out of it, and they either just, you know, identify, <coughs> identify with their own gender or the sex that they're born with, or they, they turn out to be gay. But they really, you know, only I think just under 1% of them actually end up being transgender. Um, but I, I've often observed how the, the, the goalposts have moved, because back in the day, to be actually transgender, you were diagnosed with gender dysphoria, with, which was a legitimate mental health condition, which was 
was identified by a deep disconnection with the the sex that you were you were born as um and now it's moved to you, you just depending on how you feel on tuesday so if you're one gender <laughs> on on tuesday and then a, a, a garden plant on thursday that's perfectly valid <laughs> so the goalposts are moving and we're, we're kids are suffering at the hands of this because there really is no objective standard and now we're at the point where we're allowing children to do this without without their parents consent um so really it is kind of highlighting where this ideology is prevalent in, in our public life, but also realizing that just because you choose to identify something doesn't mean that it must be reflected in public policy because there are real life consequences. Just because you choose to identify as a woman doesn't mean pol public policy now has to treat you as a woman because there are many implications with regards to that with regards to sort of women's spaces and women's shelters, women's prisons. We, we know the yep. issue of Isla yeah. Bryson in Scotland, the uh, trans identifying rapist who raped uh, three women over the course of five years that somehow managed to find himself in a female prison that effectively uh, deposed the first minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. So there are, there are real world consequences. And it's very important that we call these out because it's, it's quite an insidious ideology. Esther, I think you're going to start a fight between James and I because I disagree very much that <laughs> well the done, UK Esther. is far down this road. The UK has some resistance to this craziness. Australia doesn't. You mentioned uh, Nicola Sturgeon essentially losing her job over these self-ID laws. Those self-ID laws are in place in places like Victoria. Yep. We've got a male-bodied rapist with a functioning penis in Melbourne's biggest female prison right now, despite the objections of many female prisoners. So we don't have it. We don't have the counter to it over there. What I'm worried about isn't just a child saying um, I'm now a they or a he or a she, but the medicalisation that comes after that. Because as we've seen mm. with the Kira Bell case that went all the way to the High Court in the UK and what we've learnt about Tavistock... These procedures and treatments, whether we're talking about testosterone or double mastectomies, that they, they are devastating. They can have life, but they do have lifelong consequences and are ir irreversible in mo many cases. Yeah, this is where you know transgenderism as an ideology is seeping into public life because now public policy is reflecting a reality that isn't actually reality. So the idea is if you identify as the opposite sex, now we must medically transition you because that's a form of gender affirming care. And you know this is actually getting worse in England. I mean, the Labour Party are talking about reforming the Gender Recognition Act of 2004, which makes it easier to self ID as as the opposite sex. I mean, we're, re we're really not seeing the kind of progress we should be seeing uh, even after the whole. Isla Bryson case and all the various kind of scandals that have happened here in the UK, particularly with regards to this, the Tavistock Clinic. Um, so it, it is really getting worse. Um, but it's about also drawing a line in the sand. You can identify as however way you wish. You know, you'll be treated with respect and courtesy as you always have been. But in terms of public policy, that is not going to be the reality that's reflected in it because it actually has dire consequences for a good chunk of the population, primarily women. I don't see many men complaining about, you know, trans men in men's shelters or in men's sports because it just doesn't exist. This is clearly a threat exactly. to women. Mm. And the fact that people like J.K. Rowling have been demonised for pointing that out just shows how far we've sunk into this, this matter of absurdity. The, the inmates are running the asylum. Mm. Absolutely. And you're right, Esther, to call uh, what's happening to many of our kids child abuse. And you're right that it's the, it's the women and the children who are suffering. There's a war on women and the child abuse is getting tied up into it. It's absolutely outrageous. And the more people who speak up against it, the better. Esther, just want to pick your brains on what happened in Holland. So there we, we've talked on this show last week about how there was a Dutch revolt amongst the farmers. A, uh, the, the farmers rebelled against all this climate change madness, getting nitrogen out of the soil and so on and so on. They had a huge win with a brand new party. Uh, called the Countryside Party, or, or the, the equivalent thereof, the Farmers' Party. Uh, I, I was interested by an article in the UK Telegraph uh, saying, is it time for a country party in Britain? And the idea being that the Tories, in the same way that the Liberals here, seem to have lost touch with basic working-class rural regional people. What did you make of that suggestion that the Tories have lost touch with the with the regions, with the masses, and that there is the need for some kind of conservative countryside party? 
Well, it, it would be nice if we could start with a conservative party. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because we, we don't we don't seem to have that. I mean, anyone who read that article knows that, you know, farming in Britain is too far gone. They're not as proactive as the Dutch farmers because the Dutch farmers are the second best farmers in the world. They're the second most productive. Um, so you can understand their resistance to laws being made in, in Brussels that have effectively been transposed onto Dutch society without actually understanding the nature of, of, of Dutch farmers and, and what their work entails. Um, but it just goes to show, you know, one of the reasons for Brexit. Um, it was just this complete disconnection between these bureaucrats and, and, and technocrats in Brussels and the local populations. There is really no form of true democracy because the, the disconnect is so huge. It's, a, it's effectively a, a chasm that you can't uh, cross. Uh, but in terms of the UK, I mean, that ship has long sailed. <laughs> <laughs> we need a Conservative Party in Britain. Bring back Maggie, I always say.